Hello, sir. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Should we start the session now? Yes, please. Okay. So hello and welcome to all. This is Ankana, the assigned moderator from IJCP Group. I wholeheartedly welcome all the delegates across the country. We are fortunate enough to get supported by the doctors. Thank you all the doctors for taking out time to join us today. Now I am taking this opportunity to welcome today's master doctor, none other than the eminent speaker, Dr. Anil Ganjo, sir. Sir is MBBS, MD in dermatology, venereology and laparoscopy. Leprosy, consultant dermatologist at Skinovation Clinics, the world of aesthetics, model town, New Delhi. Now, with the help of Dr. Anil Sir and his wonderful insights, we will be taking a close look on today's topic, which is hormonal acne and increasing relevance in the present era. Without any further delay, Sir, I would like to hand over the session to you. Kindly proceed with your topic. Over to you. Thank you, Ankana. And uh, it it's indeed a pleasure to uh, be a part of this scientific program today and really thankful to the group IJCP for giving me this opportunity. Really appreciate their endeavor to keep on doing CMEs. And I really miss my friend, Dr. K.K. Garwal, who uh, was the torchbearer and who was the one who started all this. And I have been uh, a part of so many programs with him. So remembering him this day. So uh, friends, we are going to discuss an important topic. Acne, as you know, is a very, very common disorder and uh, and uh, almost everybody during their adolescence gets some form of acne. A little, little less or a little more is different, but almost everybody gets it because this is a physiological kind of a thing. But once it becomes more severe, it becomes a matter of concern. Uh, the patients have to see the doctor. Sometimes it can go to the extent of affecting the psyche of the patient, can have a huge uh, impact on the uh, on the psycho psychology of the patient. And then sometimes it can leave scars which can remain on the face for life and th that can have a huge impact on the quality of life. So uh, as far as acne is concerned, it happens because of four important pathogenic mechanisms. We have the plugging of the hair follicle happening because there are uh, abnormally cohesive desquamating cells in the hair canal. Uh, we have the hyperactivity of the sebaceous gland, which happens under the influence of hormones like androgens. Uh, we have in this uh, these circumstances proliferation of bacteria, particularly uh, Propionibacterium acnes or the Cutibacterium acnes as it is called now. And then we have inflammation and the sequence may not be like I have presented because lately the, uh, the literature says and the studies have shown that inflammation precedes most of the other, uh, you know, pathogenic uh, mechanisms. So it's the first, the inflammation which comes in and then the other factors come in. Now, Androgenic stimulation is one of the major parts of the pathogenic mechanism. So basically, the sebaceous overactivity plays a very important part in the production of acne because there is uh, overproduction of um, you know sebum that leads to uh, to you know uh, to multiplication of bacteria, inflammation, etc. So acne uh, is an integral part of sebaceous overactivity, and therefore uh, all the acne are hormonal. So, we, but we classify some of the acne as hormonal when the influence is quite, uh, you know, aggressive and the patients, uh, patients have a huge hormonal influence of acne and they do not respond to the conventional treatment. Then we call it hormonal acne. Now, a large number of hormones can have an influence on the sebaceous gland activity because the sebocyte has been found to have receptors to a number of hormones, which includes the androgens, as we know, but not only the androgens, the estrogens, the growth hormone, the insulin, the insulin-like growth factor, the corticotropin-releasing hormone, the ACTH, melanocortins, glucocorticoids. You'll be surprised that a sebocyte, the small cell, that constitutes the sebaceous gland has receptors for all these hormones. And not only these, it has receptors to many more. That's what it has been found. So therefore, nowadays, the sebocyte has been called the brain of the uh, you know, skin because it, it, uh, it is involved in so many uh, activities to maintain the normal uh, environment and milieu of the skin. So it's not only the you know, oil production and acne formation. And elevation of all these hormones can lead to sebocyte hyperactivity and overproduction of sebum and thus acne. Now, 
uh, we consider acne hormonal if they are recalcitrant and they have not been responding to repeated courses of our conventional therapeutic regime. So uh, if the patient, particularly a lady in her early adulthood, is not responding to our conventional treatment, then we would think that somewhere there is some kind of hyperandrogenism happening. Uh, we will see and look for associated features like hirsutism, seborrhea, frontotemporal balding, pseudoacanthosis nigricans and acrocordons, which happens because of insulin resistance. So all this put together uh, points to a possibility of hyperandrogenism and hormonal acne. Uh, these patients or these ladies will also have menstrual irregularities, premenstrual flares, oligomenorrhea, amenorrhea, uh, many a time very, very subtle, uh, you know, associations like just premenstrual flares will suggest that the patient has hormonal acne. So if a lady uh, has acne which is severe and not responding to your conventional treatment and then gives a history of premenstrual flares, you may, it may point to a possibility of hormonal acne and you may have to look for, uh, for, for hormonal disturbances which need correction uh, to get a satisfactory outcome because conventional treatment will fail unless you correct the hormonal disturbance. Uh, onset of acne in adult life. Uh, first time or exacerbation of the uh, persistent adolescent acne also points to a hormonal influence on the acne and acne predominantly present on the lower face of the of the patient also suggests a hormonal influence so when all of these are present then you should suspect a hormonal acne and probably the acne uh, acne severity acne is non response to the conventional treatment is getting influenced by the high levels or increased activity of the hormones now the increased activity of the androgens or hyperandrogenic state as we call it can happen because of two reasons one is raised androgen levels that is simple but sometimes the androgen levels may be normal but there is an increased sensitivity of the androgen receptors on the sebocytes which means the normal androgen levels produce an excessive effect on the sebocyte because the because the receptors on the sebocyte are sensitive increasingly sensitive and they respond hyper respond to normal levels of androgens and induce a uh, increased sebaceous activity now as i said hyperandrogenic state does not have only acne it can have hirsutism uh, it can have acne which is not responding to conventional treatment it can have androgenetic alopecia it can have seborrhea which is excessive dandruff it can have uh, other you know associations like infertility obesity oligo um, uh, etc and therefore, it becomes extremely important for a physician or a dermat uh, uh, to understand this situation of, of hormonal acne or hyperandrogenic acne. Now, the hyperandrogenism in females can be because of multiple causes. The most important, the most common cause is polycystic ovarian syndrome and constitutes more than 95% of the patients. So sometimes you may not be able to make a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian disease, but then uh, by the mere presence of all these features together of hyperandrogenism in a female, so you may you may infer that the pa patient most likely has polycystic ovarian syndrome or disease unless we find another cause to it. For example, an androgen secreting tumor from the adrenals, from the ovaries or elsewhere or certain adrenal causes like congenital adrenal hyperplasia or Cushing syndrome, etc., now, let's look at polycystic ovarian syndrome because which, that's the long commonest cause of the uh, hyperandrogenic state and thus, therefore, the hormonal acne. Now, this is a heterogeneous clinical syndrome constituting hyperandrogenism and ovulatory dysfunction with a typical morphology on the ultrasonograph. And uh, this is the commonest endocrinopathy in women, let me tell you. And the general prevalence is about 8% if we take just the clinical criteria into consideration. And up to 22% of the women suffer from uh, polycystic ovarian disease or syndrome if the ultrasonography is done on all the individuals on a, or a large sample. So a, a huge number of general population suffers from this condition. Now, the diagnostic criteria have been changing with time. Uh, the first ones put in, put up in 1990 by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development con cons considered just two criteria, the biochemical or clinical signs of hyperandrogenism and uh, 
ovulatory dysfunction or oligomenorrhea or men menstrual dysfunction. It did not include the uh, ovarian morphology into consideration. Uh, later, the 2003 European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology and the uh, American Society of Reproduction uh, gave the Rotterdam criteria, which included polycystic ovaries as a uh, criteria for the diagnosis of polycystic ovaries. And then 2006, Androgen Excess Society guidelines came which included the uh, hyperandrogenism or, uh, and hirsutism plus the polycystic ovaries and ovulatory disturbances and excluding uh, after the exclusion of other etiologies of androgen excess. So many uh, uh, guidelines have been given, but ultimately it is the clinical acumen of the physician that leads to the diagnosis of this difficult condition. Now, what is it exactly? Uh, these patients have a genetic predisposition to a dysregulated hormone synthesis by the ovaries. There is an increased ovarian theca cell activity that leads to increased production of androgens. It also leads to an ovulation, which has a negative feedback on the hypothalamus. By the negative feedback, the hypothalamus produces increasing levels of gonadotrophin releasing hormone that induces the pituitary to produce lots of Luteinizing hormone, high levels of luteinizing hormone again can induce androgen production by the ovaries and lead to an ovulation. So all this produces a vicious cycle. Add to this the present day lifestyle disorders like obesity which is extremely common, which is associated with insulin resistance and raised insulin levels. Raised insulin levels by themselves can induce the ovaries to produce andro uh, more androgens. It also decreases the hepatic production of the sex hormone binding globulin, which is a very important globulin that binds the testosterone in the peripheral blood. So if there are low levels of sex hormone binding globulin, the peripheral free testosterone levels rise. And that also gives rise to hyperandrogenic state. So all this put together uh, leads to a hyperandrogenemia in patients of PCOS. Now, I told you about obesity, lifestyle uh, uh, diseases, uh, and uh, metabolic syndrome uh, just now, which adds to the, uh, to, the, um, to the effects of PCOS. And therefore, insulin resistance becomes a very important aspect which should be discussed. Now, it's an important uh, defect and uh, uh, normally we see it in a pre-diabetic state and then finally it leads to the development of frank non-insulin dependent diabetes. Some degree of insulin resistance is present in most of the patients of uh, PCOS and in response to in the insulin resistance, there is increased production of insulin by pancreas and, uh, and uh, many of these PCOS patients also have an inherent beta cell dysfunction that leads to development of frank diabetes in these patients and hyperinsulinemia, as I told you, one decreases the production of sex hormone blinding globulin and thus increases the free testosterone peripherally. It also decreases the hepatic clearance of insulin uh, and therefore adds to the effect of hyperinsulinemia. Now, what is insulin resistance? Insulin resistance basically happens because of a dysfunction of the insulin receptors at the tissue level. And this happens because of obesity, because of lack of exercise, lifestyle uh, disturbances, etc. And, and it is inherent also. So if we look at the insulin receptor on the surface of the, uh, of the uh, target cell, the insulin receptor is constituted of a heterotetramer, it's a heterotetramer, which consists of two alpha chains and two beta chains, which are bound together by sulfide bound, so bonds. So this is the insulin receptor. It has on one side the, uh, the, the uh, alpha subunit, which receives the insulin. The insulin gets attached to the alpha subunit. The beta subunit spans the membrane and then once the uh, insulin uh, is uh, is attached to the receptor, it induces phosphorylation phosphorylation of cytoplasmic substrates with the help of this enzyme, the tyrosine kinase or the protein tyrosine kinase, and the induction or autophosphorylation of these cytoplasmic substrates sets in motion a cascade of reactions that leads to the final uh, actions of insulin, which includes glucose uptake, which is helpful, but also mitosis that leads to development of pseudoacanthosis nigricans, DPNs, etc., gene regulation, DNA synthesis, amino acid uptake, all this happens because of this. Now, uh, 
in the insulin resistance, which is inherently present in some patients or in PCOS, the number and uh, the affinity for insulin, the number of insulin receptors and the affinity for insulin remains unchanged. It is the insulin sensitivity which is defective. Actually, the, the enzyme uh, protein uh, phosphokinase is defective and the phosphorylation process is affected, which does not let the insulin work normally. And that leads to uh, negative feedback and an increased insulin level that induces very changes. Now, increased insulin level, I already told you, uh, inhibits the production of sex hormone binding globulin. It also inhibits the hepatic production of the insulin-like growth factor binding protein. Therefore, insulin-like growth factor levels also increase. It also works like insulin. So both of them induce, uh, induce the changes of polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome. The net result is overproduction of uh, androgens from the ovaries, increased availability of free testosterone in the peripheral blood, and thus hyperandrogenism. So hyperandrogenism therefore leads to excessive stimulation of the pilosebaceous unit and thus acne. So I told you this in detail because insulin resistance is becoming extremely important in the present uh, era of uh, you know lifestyle disturbances, lots of metabolic syndrome around obesity extra becoming an endemic in our country. So hyperandrogenism associated with insulin resistance is a huge problem. The other features uh, uh, or other factors that can lead to a hyperandrogenic syndrome are uncommon but should be mentioned. Like we have the Cushing syndrome where there is increased glucocorticoid levels from the adrenals or we have the congenital adrenal hyperplasia because of a dis deficiency of um, uh, enzymes like the 21 or 11 hydroxylase. Uh, the early and late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia, this leads to a hyperandrogenic state or we have the androgen secreting tumor or we have the acromegaly because, which produces excessive growth hormone levels. Now let's look at some of the acne syndromes where acne is very severe not because of the general physiological process of acne production, but because there's a syndrome associated. One of them is Saha. Saha is association of seborrhea, acne, hirsutism and alopecia. Uh, it is frequently associated with uh, PCOS, cystic mastitis, obesity and infertility. Another one is the Apert syndrome or the acrocephalosyndactyly, where there, is, there are craniofacial deformities, uh, there are dental abnormalities, there's proptosis of eyes, and there is pilosebaceous hyperactivity leading to acne. Then we have the Sappho syndrome, where there is joint involvement, there's synovitis, there's acne, pustulo pustulosis or palmoplatter pustulosis, psoriasis, and uh, hyperostosis and osteitis. So that is SCAFO. And then there is PAPA, another auto-inflammatory disorder where uh, we have biogenic arthritis, pyoderma, gangrenosum, and acne. So one should be aware of these syndromes, which can be associated with very, very severe acne and not responding to your treatment. And they are usually auto-inflammatory syndromes and require anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive suppressive drugs rather than just anti-acne treatment. Now, once we have thought of a hyperandrogenic state, how do we investigate? We look for serum testosterone. Uh, it is important to differentiate and find out the levels of total and free testosterone, although it's not very easy in our present uh, availability of uh, tests. But a good uh, uh, you know, uh, assay should give us a total and free testosterone separately. Uh, and uh, moderately elevated levels are seen in patients of PCOS. The, uh, about two to five nanograms per mil is a very normal association of PCOS. But there can be markedly raised levels which has other meanings also. It is important, as I told you, to know the total and the free testosterone levels. Both of them are raised. That means there is overproduction of testosterone. If only free testosterone is raised and total testosterone is normal, that means there is increased availability of free testosterone in the peripheral blood, which probably is because of a decreased level of sex hormone binding globulin, as I already told you, which is associated with insulin resistance, obesity, and decreased production of this sex hormone binding globulin in the, in the uh, liver. So this will help you differentiate between different types of, uh, you know, uh, 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 hyperandrogenemias. Uh, markedly raised levels of testosterone have to be looked at with some skepticism and any levels more than seven nanograms per mil, which are usually associated with viralization or, or, uh, or excessive hair growth 
etc. in females usually suggests an androgen secreting tumor which could be ovarian or adrenal and if you suspect a tumor you have to uh, uh, to refer this patient to an endocrinologist. Now the, 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 it's important to differentiate between ovarian and adrenal tumors, which can be done uh, by multiple tests. Th that's beyond the scope of this presentation. I'll go ahead. Uh, understanding the pelvic ultrasonography is very important in patients of PCOS. It's a very useful test, but has to be interpreted with caution. Uh, it is said that a good ultrasound and a good sensitivity for PCOS is only by a transvaginal ultrasound, but we usually do not do it, particularly in unmarried women but if you if it is possible in a married female and you want to do a ultrasound to detect PCOS it's better to get a transvaginal ultrasound done which has a high sensitivity and uh, and the diagnosis is made if there are more than 10 uh, follicular cysts less than 10 mm in diameter arranged around the periphery of the ovary in a pearl like a pearl, a pearl a string of pearls like of a presentation and then there is increased echogenicity of the or increased ovarian mass or stroma all this put together suggests the uh, suggests a polycystic ov ovarian syndrome uh, but you have to remember that many of the patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome may have normal looking ovaries and at the same time many of the patients with polycystic ovaries may not have uh, a polycystic ovarian syndrome so you have to clinically decide and corroborate uh, it to make the final diagnosis uh, the other tests that need to be done is uh, luteinizing hormone concentration because increased levels are associated with PCOS uh, because of the reasons I've already told you. Uh, and higher the uh, luteinizing hormone levels, uh, more is the possibility of an ovulation and infertility. So that's an important association of PCOS. Also, sex hormone binding globulin assays can be done. They are decreased in more than 50% of the PCOS patients. Now, congenital adrenal hyperplasia can be detected by assessing the levels of 17-hydroxyprogesterone, which is raised because of the deficiency of 21-hydroxylase enzyme which is an important enzyme in steroid uh, you know, synthesis within the adrenals. So if you suspect this, get this done, particularly uh, on the third day of your uh, menstrual cycle and the levels are raised, then you are, you are looking at congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which can be associated with hyperandrogenism without PCOS and can lead to severe acne not responding to your conventional treatment. Now, uh, lately, the concept of free androgen index uh, as a true marker of hyperandrogenism has gained a lot of popularity. And this basically uh, is the is there's a formula: total testosterone divided by the sex hormone binding globulin levels multiplied by hundred gives us a free androgen index. And it's a more uh, you know uh, correct way of looking at a hyperandrogenic state. And values of more than one fifty for men and more than ten for women uh, can uh, suggest the uh, uh, possibility of hyperandrogenism. So, and you should also screen for complications like, uh, you know, diabetes, because that's quite common associated with polycystic ovaries. Mm, insulin resistance can be assessed by assessing the fasting insulin levels, by, uh, by doing a parallel insulin level with the oral glucose tolerance test. And uh, also by doing a HOMA, which is uh, which is slightly complicated, and the hyperinsulinemic glycemic clamp test, not generally used in practice. It's usually meant for uh, for uh, for um, um, for research. Finally, coming to management. So when you have acne, which uh, which uh, clinically uh, point to hormonal influence and you feel that the patient has some hormonal problem, do the investigation. And once you uh, find out what the cause is, treat it. So in most of the patients, they are PCOSs, they have lifestyle problems, they have high, they have a, a obesity and increase in weight. So manage their weight, manage their lifestyle and uh, weight loss and lifestyle management can go a long way in improving acne in these patients. It decreases the insulin resistance, it decreases the insulin levels, increases the sex hormone binding globulin, therefore the less availability of free testosterone peripherally. And it is, it is said that just a 5% weight reduction uh, in these ladies improves the acne and hirsutism by 40% and it can also help restore the menstrual regularity and fertility. So lifestyle management and weight loss becomes the most important part of the management of these patients. Uh, we also use insulin sensitizers in patients of PCOS, particularly if there's a uh, 
overt uh, insulin resistance and there are raised levels of insulin. Metformin in doses of 1 to 2 grams helps in the same way as the weight loss helps and uh, gives similar effects. The side effects are, uh, are uh, GI side effects and generally these can be avoided by starting with a lower dose of about 500 a day and then go slowly to 1 to 2 grams. Uh, thiazolidine dions have been used out of them. Proglitazone, which was used earlier, is not now used because of fatal hepatotoxicity. Pioglitazone can be used at a dose of 45 milligrams a day. And in patients with PCOS, it improves acne and hirsutism both. In patients who have polycystic ovaries and menstrual irregularities, oral contraceptive pills are very helpful, particularly when combined with antiandrogens like spironolactone. So the two together have a good antiandrogenic effect and help in not only controlling acne, but also other signs of hyperandrogenism like hirsutism. Uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs are used but the problem is that they have to be given parenterally and they have to be given by, under strict supervision of a gynecologist only they are particularly used only if the patient is unresponsive and needs uh, needs ovarian induction for ovulation and has infertility uh, as i told you late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia although rare is not uh, extremely uncommon we see it many a time in our patients. So it's important that you do this uh, level also, the 17-hydroxyprogesterone. And you, if you detect late onset congenital hyperplasia, you have to give them low-dose steroids for a long time. It can be up to six months or a year uh, until you control the uh, signs and symptoms of severe acne and hirsutism. So you give dexamethasone 0.25 or 0.5 milligrams uh, per day or equivalent of prednisolone. Uh, over a long period of time. So low doses, long period of time. Uh, you may need higher doses if you need to uh, to uh, you know normalize the ovulatory function, which is the domain of the uh, endocrinologist or the gynecologist. And uh, uh, you may have to give antiandrogens also. And combination in such a situation of an antiandrogen with low-dose steroid gives wonderful results in patients of severe acne not responding to treatment. Now, androgen receptor blockers are the most effective, particularly when combined with oral contraceptives. And the common ones are spironolactone, uh, cyproteron acetate, and flutamide. Uh, cyproteron acetate uh, is used alone or in combination with the uh, ethanol estradiol uh, low dose uh, uh, as an oral contraceptive. If it is used alone, it is given on the last 10 days of the cycle. It is a very effective way of managing hyperandrogenic state and treating severe hormonal acne that is not responding to treatment. Uh, side effects can be uh, amenorrhea and menstrual uh, uh, disturbances, uh, rare liver toxicity and a three to four month washout period is required before conception. So this you have to keep in mind. All the anti-androgens, uh, the patient has to avoid pregnancy and a washout period of three to four months for all of them, be it spironolactone, be it uh, cyproterone estate or flutamide. Spironolactone is an aldosterone antagonist. Uh, it's basically a diuretic, has weak anti-androgenic effect also and also inhibits the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. Uh, doses are 25 to 200. Generally in acne, we have seen that doses of 25 to 50 work well and we don't need to go to higher levels. And uh, polymenorrhea and menstrual irregularities are common. So if you get them, then you combine it with oral contraceptives that gives the best effect. Flutamide has the problem of uh, liver toxicity. So generally we do not use it. It has been used extensively in the past, but we do not now use it because of the as possibility of liver toxicity. Uh, in addition to blocking the androgen receptor, it decreases the testosterone and DHES levels, decreases the synthesis of the androgens and increases catabolism of the, uh, of the uh, androgens. So uh, the common side effects are dry skin, nausea, loss of libido. Now, finasteride can be used, uh, although not very useful in patients of acne, but it is uh, very useful in patients of uh, androgenetic hair loss, patterned hair loss, uh, as a one milligram tablet in male and as a five milligram tablet in female. Again, you have to keep it in mind that it's a teratogenic, so you need three to four months of washout period before uh, the lady can conceive. 
uh, remember to uh, refer to a gynecologist if the patient has severe menstrual uh, irregularity, if the patient is infertile and needs ovulation, ovul ovulatory induction or has ovarian tumors, and to the endocrinologist if the patient has adrenal tumor, Cushing syndrome, pituitary adenoma, etc. Therefore, friends, uh, suspect hormonal acne if the acne are extremely recalcitrant. They're coming again and again. They're not responding to repeated courses of your conventional therapeutic regimes, uh, particularly the acne which are associated with other signs of hyperandrogenism like hirsutism, seborrhea, frontoparietal balding, acanthosis nigricans. Uh, severe acne can also be associated with menstrual irregularities, premenstrual flares, uh, Suspect hormonal acne if they happen for the first time in adulthood in females or they persist from the adolescent acne and particularly if they are distributed on the lower, uh, lower side of the face along the jawline, etc. If you suspect them, then look for a cause, investigate, manage the hormonal derangement along with the conventional acne management because no matter how much acne treatment you will give, uh, you will not succeed unless you control and manage the basic hormonal disturbance and then get a satisfactory outcome. Uh, thank you very much, friends, for your kind uh, attention. We'll go to questions and answers. Over to you, Ankana, for taking us for to, to the questions. If there are any. Thank you so much, sir, for the comprehensive talk and the PPT was so much informative. Uh, sir, we have received few questions from our participating doctors. With all your permission, can I put them across? Yes, please. Okay. The first question we have received, that is, what potential side effects or risk are associated with long-term hormonal therapies for acne? Uh, you see, all of them uh, are not recommended to be used for a long time, except yes, metformin is a safe drug which can be given for a long time. But uh, uh, drugs like OCPs, androgen receptor blockers, etc., we do not recommend for more than uh, six months or up to a year. Then we reassess and only if the patient requires, we continue for a long time. So, for example, oral contraceptive uh, usage, some of the oral contraceptives are associated with weight gain, are associated with increased, uh, uh, increased uh, you know, likelihood of, uh, of a hyper -em uh, embolism or uh, uh, hypercoagulable state that can lead to, uh, you know, uh, embolic phenomena like stroke, etc. and deep vein thrombosis, etc. So, you have to be careful. Uh, you have to ask for all this history and long term, you have to keep on on observing your patient and assessing your patient time and again to find out if there is any side effect development. Okay. The next question we are moving, that is, how does hormonal acne manifest in adult women compared to adolescents and are there unique challenges in treating each group? I told you the differences. Uh, difference number one is the first most important uh, thing is a patient uh, uh, getting acne for the first time in adulthood. So uh, acne happening beyond say 28 or 30 uh, most likely is hormonal. So you have to suspect hormonal acne in them. Then you will have these patients not responding to the conventional uh, regimes that you normally use to treat acne. They'll have get, get some relief with the regimes, get a recalcitrance, the acne go and come and go and come. Uh, predominant distribution of acne along the uh, jawline or the lower face also suggests hormonal acne. And then if there are other associated features of hyperandrogenism like uh, frontoparietal balding, uh, like uh, hirsutism, uh, like pseudoacanthosis nigricans. And if these signs are present, then you should suspect hormonal acne. And definitely a very challenging situation compared to the adolescent acne, which generally does not have the hormonal in influence. It responds to our conventional therapy very, very easily. These patients will not respond completely to the conventional treatment unless you have an eye for suspecting the hormonal influence in the acne in adulthood. Uh, you will miss it out and you will keep on giving the conventional treatment, which will fail. Uh, it is only when you combine the hormonal treatment with the conventional treatment will you succeed in treating these patients. Okay. Next question we have received, that is, in cases of long-term hormonal therapy, what are the key considerations for ongoing patient follow-up? You see, I told you uh, uh, patients on long-term old contraceptives, you have to keep on, uh, you know, assessing for uh, one is weight gain, two is uh, uh, particularly thromboembolic phenomena. 
you have to keep on asking the patient about that you have to keep the patient well hydrated they uh, they should avoid uh, you know uh, long flights all these things are to be uh, taken into uh, consideration and then there are drugs like uh, like the anti androgens uh, some of them are hepatotoxic so you keep on uh, assessing the uh, hepatic function time and again uh, some of them can uh, can influence the uh, the the uh, electrolytes like the spironolactone can affect the uh, uh, potassium levels uh, they, it can raise the potassium levels so it can cause hyperkalemia particularly if you are giving some other pot potassium sparing drug particularly potassium sparing diuretic so you have to be careful about that uh, then um, generally these are the considerations uh, for long term use of these drugs Okay, next question is, are there emerging therapies or research findings that suggest new avenues for addressing hormonal acne? I think the most important thing uh, that is, you know, uh, in these days is the importance of lifestyle management because metabolic syndrome is something that is coming as a huge endemic all over the world and India is not uh, not behind in this endemic. We have most of the children these days, you know, sticking to their laptops, not going outdoor, not getting outdoor exercise, uh, uh, sticking to junk food, uh, you know, lack of exercise, all that put together. The uh, lifestyle management is the most important part of the management in these patients. So if, if these patients maintain a healthy lifestyle, a good diet, uh, most of their problems are taken care of. Uh, uh, that's that's what the latest research shows. And also, um, because metabolic syndrome is a is is an important component of most of these hormonal acne and uh, hyperandrogenic states these days. So, insulin sensitization uh, and uh, and looking at insulin resistance uh, is an important part of your uh, management. And if patient needs an in insulin sensitizer, the patient should be counseled many a time the patients and the parents are very wary about using insulin sensitizers like meta metformin but it's a wonder drug it definitely it helps not only in you know uh, improving the insulin resistance it also helps in weight reduction and weight reduction then further helps in decreasing the insulin resistance and insulin level so i think lifestyle management is the most important thing that has come lately the last question we are taking that is how do oral contraceptives play a role in managing hormonal acne and what consideration should be made when prescribing them? Oral contraceptives are very useful uh, and particularly when they are combined with uh, anti-androgen like spinal lactone. So what do oral contraceptives do? The major thing the oral contraceptives do is one, they regulate the menstrual cycle, which is disturbed in many patients of polycystic ovarian disease. Uh, once they regulate the menstrual cycle, slowly the cyst the polycystic uh, you know uh, morphology of the ovaries is also taken care of the estrogen component in the uh, in the uh, oral contraceptives stimulates the production of sex hormone binding globulin by the uh, liver and uh, because uh, with the rise in the levels of sex hormone binding globulin that there is rise in there is uh, increased binding of the testosterone and fall of free testosterone levels in the peripheral blood and uh, that leads to uh, that leads to decrease uh, androgenic uh, hyperandrogenic state uh, the oral contraceptives also have a direct effect on the ovaries and they decrease the androgen production by the ovaries and when they are combined with androgen receptors they make a wonderful synergistic combination and uh, uh, one they act on the ovaries two they do not allow the androgens act at the periphery so uh, they are a wonderful drug particularly when combined with uh, with uh, anti androgens and they are particularly used in patients who will have a definite features and criteria suggesting polycystic ovarian syndrome and who have menstrual irregularities particularly so and also where you don't want the patient to conceive then you give them oral contraceptives and then give them anti androgens give them isotretinoin then you are free to give them all kinds of drugs that are that are contraindicated in pregnancy or, and in reproductive age otherwise Okay. Thank you so much, sir, for answering all the queries of our doctors. And I would also like to thank all the participating doctors for your continuous participation at our platform. Thank you once again, sir, for your valuable time and for being with us at our platform and sharing such valuable insights to us. Thank you so much. With thank all you. your permission, sir, can we just stop the live now?
Yes, please. Okay, sir. Thank you so much.